Thank you very much. And I already saw in the chat a few questions. I think you at least addressed some of them, but maybe we go through them again. Uh, some, some. I'm done. I'm not sure if all the questions in the chat have been sufficiently answered. Uh, so please, maybe raise your hand again and and re-ask your questions if you feel you still need an answer to them. Yeah. So I, I can start with the ones I currently see, and then feel free to also just um, unmute and ask the next, the next questions. So I think Gavin and Tom is probably a similar question. So recombination model depends how you want to model it for recommendation. Um, you can do recombination, you could model them kinetically. Um, generally, you can also basically do a um, um, recombination collision ionization of Sahel equation um, to have a, have a balance. Um, but yeah, I don't have recombination modeled right now. But if there's a numerical model that you can implement, for example, similar to collisions, um, then yeah, one could totally put this in. And so that's relevant for yeah, long regularization types. Um, yeah, but we didn't have this need right now since we are, uh, yeah, didn't have the application yet for that. Um, I think Tom is raising his hands anyway. Uh, can, sure can I jump in here? If, yes, if can, I could. You, can you speak a bit louder or I will try to make Speak it. louder. Do you hear me? Is this okay? Yep. Um, I'm doing my best to make you as loud as possible around here. Okay. Um, uh, a decade ago or more, uh, when we started the HiBef project, a huge aspect of it was to be coupled very closely with theory and use it as an experimental platform fairly dedicated to improve physics modeling, uh, um, uh, validate new physics models, uh, and overall improve simulation capabilities so that you could do dedicated experiments um, uh, designed for HIBEF to actually test uh, complicated plasma uh, uh, simulations specifically or usually involving solid density plasmas uh, in extreme states. So the examples you've shown here are largely, you know, particle acceleration, electron acceleration, matching to accelerators, and that comes historically from the background of uh, warp at LBL and so on, and it addresses that community. You had a couple of examples of the laser ion acceleration. And so for me, the key question is, um, you know, what is the state of the art or where is the state of the art in, in your work uh, in this, area with, with laser solid interactions. Um, are you also implementing things like XFEL probing, you know, so coherent X-ray fields that then are probing those kind of plasma interactions and synthetic diagnostics and so on. Um, and, you know, how does it compare to, you know, what we're locally trying to do with whatever pickles, um, um, uh, pick on GPU, Smiley, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, where, where are the opportunities for synergy? Um, I was at Livermore a few weeks ago. I gave the HED seminar there. Uh, I met up my, with my old friends, Andreas Kemp and, and Scott Wilkes, and, you know, kind of re-emphasized this vision of this is why we built HiBef. And they said, well, talk to Axel Hubel, we do everything in warp because he's put all the physics in from pick on GPU into warp. And so I just want to get a bit of your, you know, your, your vision for is this, can this have a big role in HIBEF in the future now that HIBEF is online and starting to produce data? Yeah, thank you for the question. So it's a broad question, so I have to give a broad answer. And the, um, so the, I mean, starting fully honest with you, the uh, Warp X is it was started right from ECP for one application, one application only in the beginning, which is weight field acceleration. We we wanted to propose more when we said this, and DOE narrowed us down and said like one application is your goal that you have to deliver and you have to do it well. So obviously that's what we primarily tune on and and and, and push for. Um, but yes, you see the, the users um, that we have with Livermore and others are, and, and the implementation of these numerical methods are way broader than that. Um, it's just not the Lighthouse project that I can currently work on and publish because I, we don't have the funding for that. Um, 
the uh, in the US generally uh, anything ion and laser salt interaction is not coming from high energy physics. There's no high energy physics program in the US for for ions. Um, that's purely radiation source and electrons. So the the current direction where we're going and where there's there's renewed interest is fusion energy sciences. Um, where there is some renewed interest um, and as well as applications, but they are not high energy physics. Um, the, um, um, yeah, that's, so that's, that's the general, general direction there. The, um, then method-wise, um, absolutely, you can use the numerical methods that we are, that we are researching that are, for example, con uh, conserving energy better, that are, for example, controlling um, numerical artifacts, um, that, that look like this person looks like, oh, that's not a big problem, it's this person, but it's actually at the end directly pushing you into having higher heating in simulations, having then runs, even if you have a Monte Carlo model implement like we have for collisions, or if you have for collision ionization, if you have too much noise from using the FPV schemes of the 90s and 80s, then your rate, um, your Monte Carlo model will not be able to give you a proper, proper output. So um, yes, we already implemented a, a ton of routines that were for us, for some collisions for us, right? You, the, for us, collisions were motivated actually by being able to model the emittance growth with background ions for an electron accelerator over hundreds of meters. Of course, the same model works one to one for the solar wind direction. Um, you can totally apply this. Um, with the computational, talking then a bit more about synergy, so the things that we don't have right now. Um, so, for example, if you think about like recombinations, uh, rec recombinations, or um, also like putting, for example, the, the nicest methods that are developed in SCR, like for example, the, the work that I started in my PhD and that Brian is nicely leading with the, the SC fly interaction, um, that is the thing that would be a great synergy and that you can totally add to one code or the other um, to then get the benefits of usability, get the benefits of the nice numerical methods. And have the additional model that you need specifically for expert action modeling, um, and that yeah, that would be great. I mean, I would be I would be extremely um, happy if we could if we could contribute such models um, as well um, back and forth into the codes, or for example, take take the the focus and focus these things and contributing them um, to what X similar as we work together with Daisy Fox. Um, and, and implement like the reduced models or the, the faster models for make fields that they need. Um, yeah, that's absolutely possible. I think they have an extremely good basis and these specific points um, is exactly how we work what I showed in the first slide. We have like a collaboration with CERN and they need embedded boundaries urgently. So we implement with them embedded boundaries with the PhD students. Daisy needs specific PWFA modeling. So they take the lead on that one and we build a small extension or a, a specific code that can do exactly that. If you need something specifically for LCS2 modeling or for XFAM modeling, yeah, you could we could do exactly the same thing um, and collaborate on that. Does this does this answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I mean, so that so I guess what I'm hearing is um, you are not already the panacea end all and be all that HCDR is still doing cutting edge and forefront work in these particular areas that we need. And so uh, you would not recommend stopping our program and switching to the Axel Hubel Warp X program alone. Um, <laughs> no, I mean but, but rather a, a very a productive collaboration, uh, you know, among the users of Warp X that are interested in nine acceleration and particularly, um, you know, uh, solid density plasmas or relativistic plasmas at x files and so on would make a whole lot of sense and kind of developing a formal collaboration to um, uh, work together back and forth on advancing this area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, what, what, one thing that one can think about is, of course, you want to have, because you have a big, big amount of expertise in house, so you want to have continued development. The question is where you want to basically start to reuse other people's work and how you can get still name recognition out of that, right? So um, the due to that reason, right? For example, we intentionally don't put everything into Warp X that makes no sense, right? And what we want to have that people can identify and have name recognition and build a career with their work that they do. So specifically, like the XFOL work, um, the the action work for this SC fly stuff. These are things that you can modularize in software and totally make a name out of it. 
Pixar QED is this other example, right? Where they, they don't re, they don't they, they don't rebuild a whole part of the Excel code just to have their QED model implemented. It makes no sense. Right. So we intentionally make make possibility to make people visible in collaborations. And if they need a specific code, even do that, right? Um, and, and enable them to be able to maintain that. So there's there's multiple ways to collaborate. And it could also be by taking the work that we have in Pick and GPU, modularizing it out and making it either specifically fast or specifically external tuned modules um, and, and continuing having name recognition. But you don't want to close down development because then you lose all expertise. Um, the question is really then just, do you want to copy parts, update your own codes, or do you want to take a module and be a, like, a, yeah, I'm responsible for these parts? Thanks very much. I think it's a very important point for our strategy at HCDR and how to better maintain our visibility and connect to the uh, international community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, I'll, I will go through the chat quickly and then check if someone raised, uh, raised their hand. Um, uh, Sega, what's the question? Use memory as part of cost function or even as a cost? Yes, correct. That's a, that would be a heuristic. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you can do in the cost function, you can, for example, limit things that say like, I want to optimize for X and then cut it off if I reach a certain limit. You can try to do a heuristic and do a smooth transition between computing cost and memory cost. But all in all, heuristics are horrible for users. That use like for, that, let's say you write a heuristic that works great for laser and like vector acceleration that will just explode for the design acceleration case or then for the heat transport case. Um, yeah, heuristics work as long as you, yeah have them tested. It's the same thing as like test-based development or having an actual model. Yep. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, you pretty much. Yeah, I think uh, just to extend a little bit. So what we tried to do back then, it was of course like almost 10 years ago on Xeon Phi, mm -hmm. that we tried to also optimize the weight of the particle time, particle processing time and the weight of the field processing time in the runtime cost function. And then we optimized for it and we actually realized that the eventual relation back then was almost exactly as the memory cost. So then our eventual runtime cost function was very close to memory cost. So, so OK, let's just use the memory cost then as it's more clear for users what's going on. And if you already have a workflow for some model to play models, then you could also tune it runtime this way, right? If you just have a function in general form with coefficients, you can tune them in time based on your timing measurements. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I agree. The, that generally works. But if you have exactly the situation where you have fields, yeah, the, 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 the computing cost is roughly the memory cost. Um, and then still your optimizer will tend to say, OK, because they are low both in cost compute and memory, let's put them all on one GPU. Um, so there's, there's, still, there's still a problem, though. Um, even they have this nice relationship for, for the basic algorithm. Yeah. Um, then Klaus had a question about um, not fully aware about the latest developments, scheme developments for PML-like boundary conditions, uh, or for PSADD used in Warbanks. So PML is perfectly matched layers. That's a boundary condition that you use to have open boundary conditions in pick codes so that you can let them fields travel out of the simulation domain. And there are a couple of developments, yes. Specifically, I post, post you one archive in there where we try to implement, uh, where we update actually PMLs to not only work for waves, but also for charge party disappearance. And our motivation, I, I, I great, actually, our motivation for that one is again, we need mesh refinement for being able to, uh, to model in a laser vector accelerator, highly intense beams with low emittance. That's why we need mesh refinement. That same thing works one-to-one -one for mesh refinement for a design acceleration. And it's the same, same question you have to address. It's not your overall boundary. You can put it for the um, inside domains between the refinement patches, and you need to use that there. Yeah. That's an active research topic. So I'm not, I'm not telling you mesh refinement is, is solved, right? It's like we're researching this actively. It's, it's a challenging problem. Um, but it, um, but this is one of the stepping stones um, to to get this done. Um, yeah, and uh, because because that was exactly my I like very much your one slide where you showed the mesh refinement is it has always been seen a bit on as a as a as a way to better use uh, compute resources in the sense of flops. Yeah, but I think this has gone away mostly. I would, I would say most of this is no longer due to not available flops because we're not using flops anyway. I think what, what we have seen now is the memory is the limiting part where mesh refinement can, can help you with 
yeah. in, a, in a sense, because you do not always have to have full resolution everywhere. Yeah. Um, and as, as you showed, I, I, I like this very much that you showed a laser ion acceleration for that, that kind of part, because you have a lot of differences in density, actually. Yeah. Uh, however, that's also the application in, in, in my general feeling where not knowing what you do exactly will cost you much more than in laser electron acceleration because there are a lot of the theory and a lot of the understanding and also the general geometry helps you in spotting easily that something is going wrong while i think in laser ion acceleration there is just no way even with long-standing expertise to see whether you can really do something or there's let, let's let's say you can easily miss something what, what would be your, your view on that one? Do you think that a general analysis of, of electromagnetic plasma acceleration suffices to also go into laser ion acceleration with, with AMR and be happy with it? Or do you think that we need to put on an extra effort there? The, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I'll show details of this at AC. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, uh, the um, um, generally speaking, from my current results, what I can always say is, it, I mean, it, it does work generally. Um, the uh, for for anything that you have, for anything where you have, let's say, expanding fronts, right? Anything tennis a kind of thing, RPA kind of thing. The the nice thing about these targets is they're thinnish compared to the acceleration length, so you never actually need to cross the measure fine patch. Mm -hmm. Right? You can you can stay across them, or if you cross the measure fine patches. Basically, for me, uh, from expansion, so be so exponentially long that you have low currents and then actually artifacts through automatically. Um, but if you really want to do things like, so for example, like in the past, there were like, uh, let's say, heavy ion based fusion concepts, right? Where you want to refine in the target multiple times. Um, and you have really, uh, let's say, the example that I showed, for example, with the, with the spherical, with the spherical target there. Um, if you really need to put energy into position there for any fusion application, then it gets way more challenging, right? Because you have these currents going back and forth a lot. Um, I think that's I think that is a is a great application there. I think we one can get there controlling that, but it's not like immediately done already. Um, the it's a question more about how you want to analyze it and control it or yeah, finally, it's the question, how do you know that you're right? Because I think we have done a lot of work in, in terms of laser yeah. electron acceleration to look at that. And, and we have seen many, many problems with that along, along yeah. the road, but we were actually able to see because we understood the physics quite well. In laser or in high energy density physics, let's put it like this, uh, it's really getting complicated to even know you are wrong. Yeah, but in, I mean, one thing that you can really just do is you, uh, let's say you have a problem that you're just about to model because there's a new HPC system, just model it in full resolution and then model it again by initial format. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if the result is actually you can save a resolution of factor 16 and save this all in 3D, which is then all, I mean, just to power 3D computing, that just means that what otherwise would be currently your, your one in a hero simulation for the current decade can be an ensemble study. So yeah, that's that's how I currently validate this. I mean, you do them in full resolution and check is this the same physics? Um, are there observables um, that are relevant for physics? Staying the same, and there are other things that you automatically check. Yeah. Uh, many noise effects. Yeah. So yeah, no, you still have to have a full simulation uh, as reference. Um, um, yeah, definitely at least for the next years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, one question can maybe coming back a little bit to the point that Tom had, but more methodological. Yeah. But also when we look at the regime of the solid plasmas or HED or one that's better. Yeah. I'm curious. So that there are efforts where you include the atomic structure in pick, right? And uh, so it's a question of an outsider because I, I don't yeah. know all the details of pick. So my question is, um, are these efforts so what I would understand naively or intuitively is that, for example, if the atomic structure or the electronic structure in the material is important, then this would change your currents and then the fields and all of that. So do you know, for example, how important it is? Can you kind of quantify that, these effects? And are the current efforts, do they already um, address this issue? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, specifically if they have like, 
if you have a pump probe experiment where your where your probe is actually interacting with your simulation, uh, or uh, sorry, it's just a simulation, not actually physical targets. Uh, if your probe is actually interacting with physical targets, you have to, to model the detail. Um, the yeah, absolutely. So excitations um, and then organization rates and then also recombination rates or um, yeah. Um, are things that you have to model self consistently because otherwise you don't get the microscopic currents right. Right. And the so the way how we address this um, and um, the, is is by integrating COD models um, from SC fly of my check SC fly is the new version of that one um, and then self consistently carry these states along with the with the atoms. So I mean if I, if they are excited that doesn't change anything right for for the pick. For the electromagnetic part of the interaction. But the moment they actually change ionization rates, um, it, it does, or yeah, or collision ionization rates from having like really high energy electrons flying around. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, the answer is yes, yes, it is relevant. It is relevant, and XPR has great, great expertise in this, and primarize um, PhD thesis is, uh, yeah. is what can I make a, Can I make a comment here? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> We have successfully now at XFEL um, demonstrated that we can actually look selectively at specific charge states. So we have now a couple of experiments, for example, where we make a hot plasma of copper uh, and with the laser, um, we partially empty the L shell um, and we're able to resonantly pump with the XFEL K to L transitions, okay? Yeah. And then we see that in the fluorescence, the re-emission of that, and we also see that in the um, increased uh, opacity. We're directly seeing the opacity for this uh, uh, bound free uh, bound bound transition. Um, and so that's also, you know, we have lots of data on that. It's very exciting, and we have further proposals to actually look at this. So we're at the point now, and this is something that. Uh, Thomas Kluge and Lingen published some years ago in POP as one of the possibilities of actually doing charge state uh, selective probing. So we can actually look now experimentally at the evolution of a specific um, ionic charge state in hot dense plasma. Okay, so we're at the point now where it works. The experimental techniques work and we're refining them. And we can then use those in a pump probe way to look at recombination rates in principle or look at the evolution of both the ionization in the laser plasma and the recombination and the de excitation and the filling of those as a function of time. So, experimentally, we're there. Uh, it's now um, a huge challenge to actually compare that to theory and show that we really understand what's going on. So, this is an example of an ideal place where you know, dedicated uh, modeling of this kind of atomic physics um, in the plasma could be directly probed with the XFEL and would really be groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah I, think it is very, I think it is very exciting. We specifically, I mean, atomic physics can be super detailed, but specific process, right, you like to be a big transition like K-shell and and so on. These are things that you can effectively model over the event states. Um, and yeah, so that's that's exactly the the model that that finds. Uh, you know. I think at the end, I mean, at the end when we, when we will do comparisons to modeling and experiments, and will be actually two things. And I'm quite sure about is the of course we need the microscopic modeling because that's simply not an electromagnetic thing. It's not it's it's modeling, right? You you have to model them separately. But the uh, at the same time, all input that comes in will also be detailedly depend on, on the numerics. So I think it's really both the conventional road that you need to improve numerical algorithms just electromagnetically because they couple to these detailed processes and anything that you go for two KV, maybe hundreds of EV, this is stuff where pick is extremely bad. Like right? yeah, you, you have to be you have to be really careful and have to really improve the basis already and to bring this together. And coming from the other side, right, from the high energy density physics, there are, there are very few models that you can actually use today to study these processes. Right? Either they are zero D, or they are like, there are some radiation transport codes that you can use. Most of them are somewhat classified a little more. <laughs> but um, the uh, the other problem is really that they are usually fluid, right? Um, and that's another problem that doesn't really work with ultra short pulse lasers um, that well. So yeah, it's exciting times ahead. Um. <laughs>
Yeah, th th maybe, maybe along the line. So I, I saw that that uh, that that Moore is on there. Uh, is this the HED branch, or who is that actually in Livermore? Because hey, Livermore is huge. <laughs> yes, um, the uh, depends uh, multiple. Um, the uh, the uh, um, yeah, people like Tan Ima living in Tan Ima, yeah. and um, but how, so they, we have some proposals with them, but the uh, couple people that we are with the schools and and they can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question, uh, a bit more, a bit more general one. You you, you showed us the, the blast tech stack. Um, um, I went to this blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, also Tom mentioned that there are a lot of competitive software simulation tools out there, so like you got GPU or something like that for different domains and so on. Um, my question is: Is there any or are there any plans for standardizing like comparison and validation tools? For these physics simulations, uh, also in the like mental model of reproducibility of this. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I let me merge that one of Klaus' last question about mm -hmm. the chat. <laughs> just one of the chat. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, we would love to. Um, let me give you the link of the tests that we have, and you can use them at your need. Um, we have currently, it's a, yeah, I think we are. I call it yesterday. So I think it's 188 tests that we have. They are all in here, quick. And they start, similar as we did for we can GPU, they start as fundamental as starting with, uh, let's say, fundamental plasma modes, fundamental plasma instabilities. Um, so we look, for example, at one basic test is Langmuir, right? Waves looking at them in different configurations and checking that the overall complete uh, physics actually is able to model something as complex as a plasma. Um, and then we go further and have like specific applications. So we have like by any space charge models, we have a little comparison. So we have that, we have a, a test to go with. Um, then we have all the acceleration cases. But yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's uh, essential. There was an effort for that for big codes um, a couple of years back. And the problem is why this never works is because people have their own input and their own output stuff. And it's way too complicated to, ex to explain even one test. But in the end, a hundred or hundreds of tests of this test. Uh, between five different PIC codes. Um, and that's exactly why everyone should implement OPMD and pick me. <laughs> um, because then you can actually yeah, you have Python interface and you run it just with a different implementation. Um, and yeah. Because the, I, I know that there are so at first in the Monte Carlo event generator environment with Vivid. Uh, yeah. And I thought this would be also like a, a good approach for, for such simulation tools, but yeah. they are the input is slightly different. Yeah. So it's yeah, and then you have different conventions and so on. And yeah, you can totally address this by doing the extra step by doing a nice user interface mm -hmm. in Python and, sure, sure. and, and pop this together. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, the tests you can use. Um, I, I know speaking to people who's working on Pygmy, and that would totally uh, make this easier um, for validation. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's very close to my heart. Um, thank you for the question. Then um, let me see. Tom posted a new question, but I to quickly check if the intermediate questions. Um, are useful for assigning on top of the strong scaling. Uh, I asked a few points on the strong scaling program on Fugaku. No, it's like there's a ton of points on Fugaku. Um, <laughs> it's like it's literally from one node to what's the full size again? 100,000 nodes or so? 100,000, yeah. So the blue one here is Fugaku. Mm. I and went on the, the strong scaling. I think the next point actually for Crusher. Crusher goes up to here now. Um, let me open my post here. <laughs> but yeah, no, yes, that's all the points um, are, are full machines. So this is like 100% of the machine of available nodes to uh, one node. Yeah. But I meant uh, the scaling of the, the strong scaling. There are uh, only points up to 30% of the full machine. And uh, uh, ah, yeah. you have until 100%. Uh, uh, on, for Fugaku on the weak scaling. Yeah. And I just I wondered uh, yeah. whether you had too little time available to do uh, the full scaling. Yeah, I mean, strong scaling is usually like for us, it's like not really uh, important because we don't go to the machine for strong scaling, but for the weak scaling. But I think the main thing is here that it was at night at 3 a.m. and at some point they closed our location. <laughs> <laughs> because or, yeah, Japanese computing time is pretty much midnight for for the West Coast. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we didn't we didn't push this further, um, but simply because we yeah, it's, it's 
that's really important. And it would be interesting to go out those for um I'll check on the next time here if we have more data points. Um did I have to do the updated version? Yeah, no, I think that's that's how far we could measure at the time during time we had. Yeah. That's the, the, the strong skin got enough. Okay, thanks. Then Franz, oh Franz, do you want to explain your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because you did mention that you have this uh, runtime parsing because one of the simulation codes I don't remember yeah. which one. Um, you also mentioned that you just do the five inches via on the two web whatever. <laughs> um, I, I guess both are covered with each other. So I guess the runtime parsing probably helps distributing the packages, or would it be possible to distribute packages without having that? And um, given that you have now this runtime parsing, are there any um, downsides to it on the performance side to increase things to run side? Yeah, that's a good question. The, uh, um, that, I mean, yeah, there, there are follow-up questions about the, uh, the that, that's, that's a other letters. So distribution of packaging is so you can quickly install the software, intentionally pre-compile the software in a couple of variants. Um, of course, you need a single down position variant. Um, I'm actually writing up these practices. I actually wrote, no, I, I, put, yeah, I, I put like a, uh, we have a project in, in ECP, an exoskeleton project, where we discuss about exactly these, these productivity questions, right? How do I bring my software to users? How do I make my developers productive? And what's actually the science case I want to solve? Um, and the, yeah, intentionally, we, we pre compile these things as much as possible so that the user does not have to touch a compiler. The uh, function parser is intentionally put in there if you have a complex problem and want to quickly use it. The, you can imagine what's happening there. It's really called functions after functions after functions. That thing is um, not efficient, right, compared to writing a C function and compiling it out. But if that is taking 5% of your PQ, you, you don't care, right? Um, so the, uh, um, the idea is really to have a have middle way between having super tuned algorithms and having still usability and giving this way to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to be able to yeah, maybe just write a function. And um, if you want to do this better, let's say you do this in a routine of a big code that is actually taking 50% or like significant, it's on a critical part of the application. For that way, what I envision is more going the Python route and doing just the type combination of objects, right? And what you can also do with cling, you can do it with number, different, different approaches. Um, but my, my goal is to tackle really the critical part of the application. It's not on the critical part, but it's that language. Right, that's, that, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so, yeah. Thank you. Um, then, yeah, so, the, yeah, and the downside was, as I said, if you call a parser, it's not as fast. Obviously, uh, it's as fast. Um, but it's, yeah. Um, on my tests, I answered for Klaus. Tom, come here, a question about uh, Synex. Yeah, Synex is actually, uh, this is a good question. Synex continued to evolve. There is Yun Cheng uh, driving that one, and also, um, it's also. Yeah, and custom so well. Actually, I talked to them the other week. Um, the, uh, um, so there's, there's both follow up work in Panos, which is taking actually get the simulation pipeline and connecting this to, to the data and, and, and experiments and, and publishing over science gateways. And there's a follow up work as well as Slack actually for um, FEL modeling specifically, led, uh, led by Chris Myers, also a long time collaborator on OKD, and it's called Luma. Um, which is um, yeah, basically taking the same approach um, and, and evolving that. So yeah, correct. I, I think the the that's, that's some question about relevant tools for expert program of plasmas. I, I, I just wanted to yeah. add a bit to the to the final part of the question. I think one of the big drawbacks was that uh, although Panos was uh, taking up some of the things in EU call. Uh, there was no contribution from HCDR at this point. Uh, we tried to get in, but I think the political support was not strong enough on all levels uh, to stay within that. Um, and I think Panos is an EOSC project. Um, the, the extension of EOSC projects is still a bit difficult. We do not still understand whether they will be extended, though they are trying to build expertise and in which way they are going to be extended. And I think if we find this out, and we should find this out rather sooner than later, 
uh, I would say this would be a very relevant platform because what they have been mainly doing up until now is working, as you said already, also at Slack, a lot at the front ends, at the light sources and, and getting the light sources right. Mm -hmm. And also some minor works on the detection systems has been done, but not as much as the, as the radiation transport to the target. But what has significantly been lost in all this process is that you actually want to use that light for experiments. So the applications are missing. And this is showing right now in the, in the um, let's say, in the prioritization of what Panos does uh, in, in that sense. And I think that was not a, that was not a smart move in the end to keep out many of the application areas and focus on the, on the facility side of such a tool. Because in the end, the applications is what's, what's driving this. And I think if we have a chance to, to change that, we should actively change that. And there's still a question on how similar, um, similar developments in the US are streamlined. I think the relevant people are talking to each other. But it's always a, a bit of a difficulty if there is a copy paste or something, or if, if there's a lot of redoing, sim 2 e and other stuff are coming up. So that's kind of an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and specifically, I mean, what, what you just what what what, what you put here for the expert program of, of plasma for the school the audits plasmas. I mean, you know, I haven't seen exactly that application being pushed after Silex um, because there was yeah basically no project. Um, I mean, besides that labs, right? But I didn't see like a EU or a US project is specifically pushed that. Um, I think that's that's yeah exactly the application that Mike is talking about. Uh, if I can jump in here, I think um, there is an apparent or a potential kind of uh, uh, political opportunity evolving to get a little bit more interest for this kind of for the hot dense plasma aspects um, because of the um, uh, interest now in, in fusion and the crazy ass ideas to do proton fast ignition and so on with uh, uh, commercial investments and so on. Uh, but there's certainly awareness at OFES um, uh, that uh, for HED science is being you know relevant and potentially important for the future and sellable to politicians as green energy. Um, without going into that politics, I, uh, my point here is I think there's an awareness. And I, I think as a community, if we were to now go back and say, uh, look, uh, proton fast ignition is again, ion acceleration, it's energy transport, it's dense plasma physics. We would like to probe it with x-rays and so on. We need to understand this physics properly um, to advance you know, that mission in OFES uh, that the White House has taken an interest in. Uh, there might be an opportunity to actually um, uh, generate some funding out of OFES for this kind of work. I think that yeah. case should be made. It's not clear to me whether the guys pushing, you know, Marble Fusion and Focus Energy have that in their focus. My personal opinion is that they're charlatans and they just want to get a whole bunch of money to play around with laser development. But then maybe I'm an asshole. <laughs> um. Yeah, at least, I mean, at least by, by the direction of scoring after the, the recent VIF shots in the US, I mean, we are currently having a, a large series of exercises and workshops, um, as is always done in large enterprises, <laughs> <laughs> to, to figure out what's, what's going on in the future of this. Um, the, there's actually literally a workshop this week. Um, there was another one a couple of weeks ago um, where, I mean, you know, Scott and, and Andreas, they can also update you. It's not yet clear which, which will be the preferred direction for DOE. Um, and White House, consequently. Um, the, um, um, it will probably continue to be uh, more than one approach um, to hedge the bets. Um, but um, yeah, it's not even clear if, like, for example, direct, direct ion drives, for example, in the, in the mix or not, or indirect drives. Um, yeah, that's really currently uh, highly discussed in workshops. We'll see what comes out of that. Um, the, but I agree, the opportunity is absolutely there. 
the other, the other question you had is connection to MHD uh, below certain plasma temperatures is well from peak. Yeah, similarly, I mean, the, it's exactly the same case as for mesh refinement. Besides that, there's a strong case for MHD if if you actually want to have something with low noise modeling of low temperatures, low, which means vast below KV. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, that would be a great opportunity uh, wow. if someone figures out the numerics. <laughs> so, uh, I, so I that's know. A great, I don't know how I showed you the data, but there, there is some interesting data from Draco uh, on looking at uh, the using MHD expansion of a laser heated plasma column to kind of double check uh, to get a, a, a an experimental estimate of the temperature based on MHD modeling and comparing it to what one predicts from PIC. And um, there are discrepancies, or apparently there are rather large discrepancies. Yeah. And so it suggests that, as you said before, that, you know, pick doesn't necessarily work well below a KEV. Um, and, and so how we understand that and really refine that is something that's um, of current topical interest for the, the, um, the Rosendorf crowd. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly the interesting question, right? And since you have now experimental data, I mean, both at Expo, but also Draco for exactly these cases, Throw in the the, the 2020 numerics at it, not the 80s numerics, and see if it's also the same problem. That's exactly the case that we need to test against the codes that we need to test against the numerics. Um, like Klaus Steininger, for example, implements on the uh, was implementing the high order schemes for Pico GPU. We can also try, of course, warp X for comparison. Um, put them in and yeah, take a look if the same problem persists there. I would not be surprised if that can be to a certain extent. Uh, be be reduced that gap um, by using modern numerics, um, and that's that's exactly the challenge that we need. Yeah, this is exactly the things that the question that you have to pose to modelers. Um, yeah. But, but, yeah, I would I would I would phrase this question a bit differently. I think I think uh, the going going to lower temperatures requires a diff different view on pig. I think pig is quite good at high temperatures. Not just for the reasons because we have bad numerics and, and now can do better numerics. I think we have a fundamental problem with with pick, and we have to we have to think how we mitigate this problem towards lower temperatures. I think there's a there's a fundamental way of looking at a plasma at these low temperatures that we have to cross the boundary towards. Yeah, and I maybe have follow-up questions to that also. Yeah, I mean, there, there are multiple thresholds to go over um, in temperature as well as pressure. Um, but I think specifically the expansion physics is custom to come with that at IPEC. Um, I think that one is is an interesting question at the exactly at the edge. Um, that and the expansion yeah. is easy. Yeah. <laughs> and temperature ex est estimation for that. Yeah. So yeah, that would be interesting. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, there's there's one more point. I think expansion is easy. It's, it's getting quickly very non-dense in any sense, and you can do a lot of things there. I think, I think the, the inside of the target is where, you are, where things become really difficult. Yeah. LSP. Um, LSP is an implicit solver. There might be someone developing an open source version of that soon for us. <laughs> uh, what's your, what's your... Finally. <laughs> um, What's your idea? Yeah. Oh, uh, that was okay, okay, question. Okay, okay, okay. I'll put another question. Um, yeah, LSP, that's a nice benchmark of, um, I think, Pico GPU, LSP, and WarpX um, for ion acceleration. I think mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reasonable benchmark for TSA. Um, in a paper um, that was released, came recently out, the uh, yeah, LSP is um, implicit, solves, um, they're great, they're great. There's also great numerical development in Liverpool specifically. If you need anything implicit, um, yeah, could be that it changes soon. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do a follow up again. I was, I was, uh, I like the module uh, approach. You, you want to go towards uh, uh, combining different simulations. Um, uh, I, I thought it was not such a bad move in the U.S. to. Because what I what I saw was that you based this connection on MREX. 
that right? Did I understand this correctly as the as the fundamental exchange idea? Because you have it all in the last uh, uh, family of codes. Um, however, this means that I somehow have to adhere to the, uh, to Emrex in the end. I think this is a and I, and I think this is a big big thing again. Because I, I think within ECP and within up your code base, this is a this is a pretty stringent development along all the codes to do that. However, this is not there for many other codes. I I ask you a question. The uh, um, let me stop you right there. <laughs> 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 uh, just kidding. The um, so Amrex itself. Um, the way how we implement this specifically for the exchange is, is we go to open data standards or open uh, like interfaces that don't even know MREX, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say if it's good enough for machine learning um, and for, <laughs> for Google, Facebook, and NVIDIA, it's probably good enough for me. Uh, but the junk, uh, the, the things for the data structures we have in MREX are um, pretty simple, right? At the end, you have a tag data structure, like a simple cell inside the yeah, structure array. Of course, it can be more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. So we can could not we we would be limited if you would have if you need to adopt data structure that's more subtype like this. But getting the data out and interacting with it is very much possible, and you can do all the vectorization needs that you really need. The uh, um, what you might be limited in is you, if you want to do like the last 20, 30 percent performance optimization because you need something in certain ranges, tiles, and so on. For that, you could change. And the way how we lay out the data. But generally speaking, you, you're not bound to MX for that. That's the short answer. And it would be totally possible, for example, to add an alpaca module that does, for example, hyper physics or QD physics in a better way than use these data structures in, to implement just parallel four in alpaca. Mm -hmm. That would be totally possible. And what we don't do right now is that we allow our very complex data structures because for the main algorithms that we all have, there Structure array is what you need, and that tile, the tile structure array. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, it's not you don't have to implement all MREX, but intentionally for our developments internally, we of course the level leverage them all on MREX because that gives us way implementation work. Yeah, yeah, good question. And that's exactly exactly what you always want to keep in mind. Are the interfaces extensible enough so that you can in, add in more things? And that's exactly why we have this Pixar QED example as well that also works with Cocos, which can do way more complicated things uh, than MX for at least full yeah. Okay. All right, I think we, we got through all questions in the chat. Um, no raised hands. I'm just slightly over time. Um, thank you, everyone, that stayed so far. <laughs> it's always like that around here. <laughs> no worries. Cool. Um, yeah, one, one of the things maybe for those uh, at, at Rossendorf and uh, maybe some some of your teams couldn't attend today due to other duties, we record this session uh, so you can have a later access on it and we will distribute it uh, towards you. And maybe uh, Axel is even open to share this in such an open way that we can later put it on YouTube. We can discuss that. Yeah, that's um, possible. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions from the online audience, um, I thank all of you very much for coming in. And I'm especially happy that a lot of people from EPK jumped in today. Thank you very much for coming. That, that was fantastic. Yeah, and uh, we'll, I think our next task is to find a good place for lunch around here. <laughs> so have a nice day and see you soon. Thank you very much.